Here are your tin foil hats. Buckle down tight and hold on loosely as we soar over the rocky tops of the La Platas on a rocky mountain high, get sucked into the vortex of the Four Corners, and settle down snugly at Mom Marker 420 in Colorful, Colorado. It is Saturday, May 20th, aka Armed Forces Day. We uh, simplify it to all the Marine Corps out there. And thank you to everyone else, Air Force, Army, Army National Guard, um, Navy, everyone out there that is protecting our freedoms and our way of life. For those of you across the pond and beyond, it is Sunday, May 21st. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you, and welcome to We Are Paradox Media's Late Night in the Rockies. I'm your host, Tessa TNT, and we are broadcasting live from the Mile High Clubhouse tonight. If you're listening to us live, you may be listening to us on KPNL Radio, which you can find on KPNL Radio at kpnl-db.com. You may also find us live at this very moment on eTalk Radio, which you can find on eTalk.tv forward slash radio. We are also live on Spreaker, um, which is the S-P-R-E-A-K-E-R.com under We Are Paradox Media, as well as YouTube under my profile and Twitch. So I hope you guys are enjoying if you're tuning in live. If you want to listen to us in your free time, if you're working, working in, or working out, uh, you can listen to us live on the different places I told you before, or you can listen to us on your free time at We Are Paradox at Spreaker, Twitter, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, iHeart Radio, Facebook, as well as CastBox, Tumblr, SoundCloud, TuneIn Radio, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podcast Chaser, Podvine, and, um, yep, still working on that Amazon. We're also live on YouTube, which you can find, as I said before, under We Are Paradox Media. Yeah, I just love repeating myself. <laughs> so tonight, um, I have a treat for all my guys and gals out there. Tonight, we will be doing story time with me, Tessa P&T. And let me just make sure this music isn't too loud. And the big old doggies just decided to go off. Looks like we have one companion here on Facebook. Oh, I think that's me, because I'm making sure the feed goes out. And uh, like Diana said, it looks kind of fuzzy. I'm not sure why. Um, hmm. I don't know. Which one, it looks pretty, pretty clear, but everything else seems a little fuzzy. My video over here looks quite nice, but um, yeah, let me see. Maybe if I move it over, we can get some more towers. I'm not quite certain. Yes, I hope the beginning to your guys' this weekend has been epic. It will be message number really quick. Since she is here, Miss Nova. Oh, since I, I, I did a threat towards the dogs, now they're like, oh, we better be quiet. Um... So it's story time this evening with me to Team E, um, and it's going to be epic. This has been a really good book so far. It was the last book we were doing, but it's always nice to move on. So the uh, I almost said movie. So the book we're doing this evening is The World's 100th Greatest Mysteries and Strange Secrets of the Past Revealed. This is by E. Randall Floyd, and it's been very good so far, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Ooh, Stonehenge Decoded. Of all the world's great mysteries, none has haunted the popular uh, imagination more than Stonehenge, that brooding circle of giant stones towering over a windy, desolate plain in southern England. Nobody knows who built Stonehenge or why. In many ways, the origin and purpose of the megalith remains as mysterious as it did when Roman legions overran the British Isles 
more than 2,000 years ago. Was it a temple of the sun, a royal place, a magic shrine, an observatory for studying the heavens? Some have even suggested it was a gigantic computer built centuries before the Greeks mastered mathematics. By aligning the stones with astronomical formations, it is possible to mark the passage of time and predict future events, or so it is said. Until recently, many people thought Stonehenge was built by a mysterious class of Celtic priests known as Druids. According to legend, the Druids, clad in white robes and adorned with sacred mistletoe leaves, used the temple as a place of worship and as a site for bloody human sacrificial rituals. But modern archaeology has determined the mysterious structure situated on Salisbury Plain in the country of Wiltshire predates the Druids by more than a thousand years and was built in several stages of a period of several centuries. Stonehenge owes much of its mystical reputation to a 12th century historian, Geoffrey of Monmouth and Camelot. He also claimed that the magician Merlin used magic to transport stones from Ireland that were used in the site's construction. Ever since, the place has been a scene of much mystery and magic. Even though many people continue to believe Stonehenge was built by the Druids, most experts now agree that Stonehenge was built and rebuilt by a series of Neolithic peoples who inhabited the area over a period of some 2,000 years. According to some authorities, construction probably started around 3000 BC when a group of Stone Age people arrived in Britain. At that time, Stonehenge was a little more than a circular ditch and bank, about six feet high with a broad entrance. Around this formation were 30 smaller, but still immense, upright stones forming an outer circle, with 30 slightly smaller lintels making up a continuous level ring, which surfaced about 16 feet off the ground. Several centuries later, a highly developed Bronze Age group known as the Beaker Folk were credited with hauling and erecting the estimated 82 original bluestones, monoliths, each weighing up to five tons, which they probably brought by a sledge roller and barge from the Presley Mountains and Southern Wells. Refinements to stone Stonehenge were made 50 years later by another Bronze Age group known as the Wessex. It is possible that Stonehenge remained a center of some sort even into Roman times, though most experts say it is doubtful that it was used by the Druids, who favored groves and streams for the mystical worship services. <clears throat> Excuse me. One British investigator, author Daniel Cohen, explains that it had been a center of Druidic resistance to the Romans. The Romans probably would have had it torn down, as it was, they simply ignored it. Gradually, Stonehenge fell into disuse, and its original purpose was forgotten. Part of the mystery centers around its construction. For example, many experts wonder how a pre-Roman barbaric people, like the Britons, were able to build such an elaborate assembly without the required technology. Even more puzzling are the so-called blue stones. As previously noted, these enormous slabs, each weighing about five tons, could have come from only one place. The Presley Mountains and Wells, some 130, 130 miles from Stonehenge. The question is, how did they get there? The easiest way to move these stones would have been by water, said Cohen, and the most direct route would have involved floating the stones on rafts over 250 miles, 15 miles of waterways, then dragging or rolling them over land for another 125 miles or so. Point is added by Cohen, construction of Stonehenge was a local project involving native labor. 
ideas and technology. He admitted, however, there is a possibility that builders from more advanced Mediterranean cultures may have helped. Similar groups of megalithic stone circles have been found throughout Western Europe, from the misty fens of Sweden and the Shetland Islands of the north, to Spain, Portugal, and Malta in the south. One source estimated that at least 50,000 stone hint-like assemblies have been located while countless thousands of others were destroyed by Christian zealots, who saw them as pagan ceremonial centers. Many others were simply pushed aside to make way for highways, houses, and parking lots. That's sad, can't you just go around? During the Middle Ages, Christians viewed these colossal monuments as evil, the handiwork of devils and demons, of wizards or of the giants who walked the earth before the flood. In later times, people thought they were simply crude copies of the more polished monuments of the Middle East and Homeric Greece. Or is it Homeric? I'm not sure. The designs, they said, had been brought by missionaries preaching a new religion or by merchants following the trade routes which brought amber from the Baltic and tin from Cornwall to the Mediterranean world. In 1963, American astronomer Gerald Hawkins claimed to have found a simple yet complex answer to the Stonehenge enigma. In his book, Stonehenge Decoded, Professor Hawkins theorized that the ancient collection of rocks once served as a kind of prehistoric computer, its primary function being to make intricate calculations of sunrises and sunsets the movements of the moon and the eclipses of both sun and moon. While modern archaeology has answered many questions about Stonehenge, many secrets remain. So it's quite interesting, and um, my friend Jim from Scotland was also talking about the Stonehenge there that they had uncovered, and, um, you know, they have to get rid of tons of dirt and such in order for it to be shown. Um, sorry, my allergies are kind of acting up. My nose is running. Um, but yeah, uh, Scotland has its own stone, stone hands, just like I was saying, so many places have a stone hand. It's pretty interesting. Alpine Iceman. In the fall of 1991, two German hikers trekking across a glacial region of the Tyrolean Alps near the Austrian-Italian border came upon a grisly sight. Frozen in the ice and drifting snow was the badly decomposed body of an oddly attired man, armed with a copper axe, knife, longbow, and leather quiver bulging with flint-tipped arrows. Suspecting foul play, the hikers hurried down the mountain and informed the police. Only later did they learn that the desiccated corpse they discovered was that of the man dead for more than 5,300 years. It's pretty intense. The discovery of the Alpine Iceman made headlines around the world. Some anthropologists compare the significance of the find to the discovery of ancient Troy and King Tutankhamun's tomb. For the first time, scientists had an opportunity to discover the well-preserved remains of a Stone Age European. The ice mass attire, deerskin vest, leather loincloth, bearskin leggings, and it's not bearskin, it's bearskin. But me back to kiwis who say tea beers instead of teddy bears. Bearskin leggings and a conical cap made of fur provided valuable clues to long vanish culture. The dark-skinned ice man, a male probably in his late 20s or early 30s and stood five feet two inches tall, carried an impressive arsenal of Stone Age technology, including Six foot bow flint scrapper, a flint knife with string sheath, and a copper axe bound with leather. 
Elated, scientists have to find as a time capsule of everyday Stone Age life. Other items found on the body included a braided grass, aka grass mat, coarsely woven grass bag, birch bat container with a raw blackthorn berry in it, indicating that the iceman died in the late summer or early autumn a leather pouch, and a flat marble disc threaded onto a necklace decorated with 20 leather straps. There is evidence to suggest he was clean-shaven, sported curly brown hair, and wore an earring. Worn teeth indicate he probably ate coarse ground grain, or that he regularly used his teeth as a tool. I forbid my kids to do that all the time. I'm like, don't use your teeth as tools. Almost immediately, questions arose pertaining to the Iceman's authenticity. Skeptics declared it an elaborate hoax, comparable to the Piltdown Man. One expert asserted that the body was that of a transplanted Egyptian mummy, while another insisted it was the mummified remains of a pre-Columbian American. But an international research team Writing in the Journal of Science dismissed the possibility of fraud as highly unlikely. The authors based their conclusion on analysis of DNA samples taken from the Iceman's muscle, bone, and connective tissue, which seem to confirm he is a Guinean. Guinean European from the late Stone Age. I don't know, I got kind of excited because I'm Guinean too. There are relatives of the Iceman all over Northern Europe, commented Dr. Brian Sykes, an Oxford geneticist who took part in research led by the University of Innsbruck. Still, many unanswered questions remained. Who was he? Where did he come from? What was he doing wandering around glaciers more than 10,300 feet above sea level? It just doesn't make sense, said one American member of the research team. Considering the way he was dressed, he was prepared for the harsh altitude in an L.L. Bean kind of way. But the thing that eludes us is what he was doing up there in the first place. Perhaps he was a farmer or a shepherd, say some archaeologist or a trader or prospector. Others suggest he was a village outcast, perhaps a criminal on the run or exiled. Since x-rays revealed some broken ribs, at least one researcher, Dr. Conrad Spindler, author of The Man in the Ice, believes he got into a fight in a village below, and this led to his injury and flight into the mountains. But Lawrence Barfield, an archaeologist at the University of Birmingham in England, who specializes in prehistory, thinks otherwise. In an interview published in the New York Times, Dr. Barfield said a more economical explanation would be that he was already up in the mountains with his sheep and an accident prevented his descent to the valley before the snow came. Even before genetic studies confirmed this authenticity, Dr. Barfield pointed to one artifact that he says clearly refutes the idea of fraud. A small antler point inserted into a lime wood handle used in reducing flint tools. No one thinking to perpetuate a fraud would have thought to include this particular tool in the Iceman's kit, Dr. Barfield said. At least 50 radiocarbon tests have verified the age of the Iceman's body and that it had lain encased in ice since the time of the pyramids. While the unfortunate Iceman has taught us for an age, it is doubtful that scientists will ever understand the tragic fate that befell the young traveler so long ago. Pretty intriguing. Uh oh, I just lost my bookmark. Let me put a pin in here and read this. Hello, Owens. Hello, Whitney. 
Long time, Sister Whitney. Hello, Brenda. Hello, Jackie. <laughs> Got it. And this sign shalt thou conquer. Rome was worried. For centuries, the great empire had maintained peace and fostered prosperity throughout its sprawling realm, from the shores of the Mediterranean to the forests of Germany. Now, in the third century of the Christian era, barbaric warlords and political instability threatened to topple the empire. Galloping inflation added to its woes, as did marauding bands of soldiers that ravaged the countryside, slaughtering civilians and Republican guards who got in their way. Unhappy people turned to magic and pagan gods in an attempt to cope with the horrific changes sweeping across the land. Hello, Keith. Some embraced strange new religions that promised powerful supreme God was the answer to their prayers, rather than old Olympian deities. To stem the growth of Christianity, Rome's rulers had restored the harsh punishment and executions in the name of Jupiter, Apollo, Minerva, and other immortals who had held sway in the empire's capital for centuries. Christians were routinely beaten, tortured, mutilated, and decapitated, imprisoned, and thrown to the lions. Sorry, I left cat hair bit me. Then all at once it stopped. Almost overnight, Jupiter and his consortium of old gods were gone replaced by Christianity as the official state religion. What happened to bring this mystifying event about? Some scholars credit Emperor Constantine with a sudden change. According to an account written shortly after Constantine's death in 337 by Bishop Eusebius, it happened in October 312 when the emperor was marching on Rome to reclaim it from his rival, Maxentius. As Constantine approached the city, he looked up and saw, with his own eyes, the trophy of a cross with light in the heavens, above the sun and bearing the inscription, In this sign, shalt thou conquer. According to Bishop Eusebius, the emperor was struck with amazement, when his whole army also which followed him on this expedition and witnessed the miracle. That very night, Christ is said to have appeared to the emperor in a dream, bearing the same sign he had seen in the heavens and commanding him to lead his army forward to victory. At dawn the next day, Constantine ordered workmen to fashion a standard made of gold, studded with precious jewels, and bearing a monogram symbolizing his fealty to Christ. Behind the ensign, and according to some accounts, with a special sign of the cross painted on every shield, Constantine's soldiers defeated the enemy at Milvian Bridge on the river Tiber. Where's the Tiber? I think it's Tiber. Constantine entered Rome victorious and from that day on a committed Christian. Or was he? Some scholars suspect that Constantine never truly abandoned his pagan ways, even though he ascribed his specular military success to the vision of the Christian cross, and much later in life was baptized into the Christian faith. One view holds that the emperor continued to worship the sun god Mithras, the religion of his father and several emperors before him. Other scholars point to the fact that Constantine scratched pagan symbols from his coin and even removed his statue from pagan temples as proof of his conversion to Christianity. During this long reign, Constantine saw to it that Christians were treated fairly, even though he continued to tolerate paganism as well. He enacted many laws favorable to Christians, prayed every day, and enjoyed the company of Christian bishops. The evidence then seemed overwhelming that Emperor Constantine did believe in the Christian God. The Edict of Milan, which granted Christianity the same rights as all other legitimate religions, 
and his baptism seems to support his view. Did Constantine have the experience that Eusebius describes? Scholars has, uh, have wrestled with that question for more than 1,600 years. Many skeptics want to know why and how such a startling revelation could have been kept secret until after the emperor's death. How, too, they wonder, was it possible to create an elaborate bejeweled standard in a single morning, almost on the very day of battle? And why, after being converted to Christianity in such a miraculous way, was the emperor not baptized as a Christian until the last year of his life? Historians believe that in an age of superstition, stories about divine visions were bound to gain currency. Everybody at the time, big or Christian, believed in miracles and the wonder of Constantine's conversion as narrated by Eusebius. It had a tremendous impact not only on the bishop's contemporaries, but also on many generations to come. There can be little doubt, however, that something happened to the emperor on the eve of his entrance into Rome. Some scholars have suggested that his vision may have been caused by what meteorologists call the halo phenomenon, in which ice crystals in the upper atmosphere form light rings around the sun. We've taken pictures of that, and it's so beautiful. Very occasionally, such rings interlock in a pattern that can suggest cross to the viewers. I've never seen that. I've just seen the rings. In any event, Constantine was certainly not a Christian before the Battle of Milvian Bridge, but scholars say the victory convinced him of the power of the Christian faith, and he never forgot it. After unifying the Western Empire under his own rule, he moved quickly to help the poor and repressed Christians, who now suddenly saw their religion elevated to great heights of power and prestige. And for the rest of his life, Constantine's imperial armies marched behind the sacred lava room, and the name given the banner on which Constantine's monogram of Christ was inscribed. And they never failed to emerge victorious in Popsimo. AKA in this sign. Pretty interesting. Let me see who's watching. Alright. Hello, Twitter. Hello, Facebooker. I'm so glad you guys joined us. The Man in Mud. In the summer of 1950, peat cutters worked among the acidic bogs near Poland, Finn, and northern Denmark and covered the naked body of a well-preserved body man with noose around his neck. Police were called in to investigate, but the corpse was no recent murder victim. Radiocarbon testing showed the dark leathery brown body crowned with a shock of reddish hair to be at least 2,000 years old. The body was similar to hundreds of other bodies pulled from the deep bogs of northern Europe in recent years. What made the Tolan discovery so unusual was the high degree of preservation and serenity of the corpse. His face wore a gentle expression, wrote Professor Peter V. Grof, the Danish archaeologist called in to examine Tolan man, as the victim came to be called. The eyes were slightly closed, but softly pursed as if in silent prayer. Some say he was the victim of an ancient execution. Others contend his death was part of a ritualistic sacrifice to pagan gods. Dr. Glob, a leading authority on the so-called bog people, suggests a Tolan man might have been a priest who volunteered to be strangled with a ceremonial rope and buried in peak on a northern fertility goddess during a winter festival to hasten the arrival of spring. 
It was on just such an occasion that bloody human sacrifices reached a peak in the Iron Age, Dr. Glob wrote. But Dr. Glob and other investigators are quick to make distinctions between Tolan Man and the hundreds of other Iron Age log burials scattered throughout Northern Europe. While most victims found in the bog died extremely violent deaths, strangulation from either hanging or eroding, physical blows to the head, or from multiple stab wounds to the heart, Tolan Man apparently suffered no brutal treatment at the hands of his executioners. This one, Tolan Man, bore no signs of violence other than the marks of the news, he said. The Nordic peoples, until they turned Christian many centuries later, associated bringing less with punishment than with offerings to their gods. Adding to the mystery was the fact that Tolan Man had no palaces and was well groomed and stripped before being deposited in the bog. This, state investigators, is a clear indication that the victim was a high social standing, perhaps even a leader. During the Middle Ages, superstitious peat cutters usually associated bog people with evil and quickly reburied them in consecrated soil. Many peasants avoided the lonely bogs because they feared encounters with the devil. But it wasn't until after World War II when modern dating technology became available, scientists learned the antiquity of the bog people. Altogether, some 890 bodies have been recovered from bogs in Denmark, Germany, England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, and elsewhere in Northern Europe. The best documented and most numerous are the Danish finds, particularly in North and Central Jutland. Or is it Jutland? Not sure. The Danish finds include Tolerman, whose collaborating head now rests in the Silkborg Museum in central Jutland, and an equally famous neighbor, Grabalman, whose throat was slashed from ear to ear. He, sometimes around 100 BC. <clears throat> Excuse me. A few finds are truly ancient. One from the Mesolithical period, about 3000 BC. Their specimens are surprisingly recent. At least one is a strapping man staked into the bog with a birch staves as late as 1360 AD. The remarkable state of preservation of the bog people has been attributed to the unique chemistry of a peat bog. Everything is anaerobic in bogs, explained Dr. Hayden Pritchard, a botanist at Lehigh University and the Wetlands Institute of New Jersey. Particularly at the lower levels, there's almost no life because there's no oxygen. You need oxygen to degrade flesh. So perhaps that's why they were so well preserved? I'm not sure. The question archaeologists hope to answer someday is why so many Iron Age people were thrown into the bogs and murky waterways of Northern Europe. Were these human deposits made to appease pagan gods, as many suspect, or were they barbaric forms of punishment? Some researchers theorize that these dark places of earth and water had religious significance, perhaps some special meaning to the people of that far-off age. Perhaps they were seen as gateways to the next world or, at worst, tunnels to the hellish regions below. Hmm. Star-crossed voyagers. 
North Africa, members of the poor cave-dwelling tribe of farmers claim that fish like gods from the sky visited them thousands of years ago, leaving behind a unique mythology rich in astronomical knowledge. According to Dagon, or Dagon, I think it's Dagon, tradition, these cosmic creatures originated in a star system called Sirius, the dog star. Sorry, I have kind of like a soft spot for that. Some 8.7 million light years away. They came in a flaming arc that made a whirring dust storm as it landed, while a huge blowing object, presumably the mothership, waited above. Dagon claim that the extraterrestrial's purpose in coming was to civilize the people of Earth. Mythologies of other ancient lands, Babylonians, Egyptians, and Greek, make an amphibious gods bent on similar star trekking missions. Many tribal myths in the New World tell of similar encounters with watery deities, some of which rose from the depths of the land to tame and educate the heathens. It wasn't until early 1950s that the outside world discovered the secrets of the Dagon, who inhabit the bleak and formidable region of Mali, some 300 miles south of Tambaktu, formerly Tambaktu. That was when two French anthropologists who had lived among the tribe from 1946 until 1950 were initiated into their religious order. In a paper titled, A Sudanese Serious System, the Frenchmen, Marcel Griaud and Germain de Perlin, recount the Dogon, believe that ancient spacemen gave them knowledge of a dark star in the constellation Canis. The existence of such a star, hence had the companion to Sirius known as Sirius B, had been suspected by scientists since the mid-19th century was not described in detail until the 1920s. Long before the Dagon knew the star, invisible to naked eye, was made of matter heavier than any on Earth and moves in an elliptical orbit, taking it 50 years to do so. It was not until 1928 that Sir Arthur Eddington postulated the theory of white dwarfs, stars whose atoms have collapsed inward so that a piece the size of a pea would weigh half a ton. Sirius B is the size of Earth, yet weighs as much as the Sun. Is it possible that the Dagon learned his complex theory from some knowledgeable space traveler? Or did they learn it from some more plausible source? A traveler from Egypt, perhaps, or a modern European visitor? The late Dr. Carl Sagan openly criticized the notion that ancient starmen dropped out of the sky and landed in such a desolate location. He considered it far more likely that the Dagon gained their knowledge from traveling Europeans around 1930, a time when details of Sirius, his tiny companion star, and other astronomical data later related to Riau and Interven had become common knowledge in the Western world. Oriental scholar Robert Temple thinks otherwise. Author of several books on this subject, Temple believes that the knowledge shown by the Dagon cannot be explained away as coincidence or diffusion. The knowledge passed on through contact with outsiders in the serious mystery. He points out that the Dagon have an extraordinarily detailed knowledge of the solar system. And how? Like, they don't have telescopes or anything. It's so amazing how so many ancient peoples lined up with the stars. Yes, that can be simple if you do it uh, correctly at the right time, but even, okay, the pyramids, um, ancient Indian structures, so many things lined up with, with uh, these different things as far as the solar system. For example, they said the moon was dry and dead, and without benefit of a telescope that drew pictures of Saturn with rings around it. How did they see that? Like, that amazes me. They knew about the movements of Jupiter as well. 
Seriously? Like, I can't even see that with my naked eye. And they recorded the movements of Venus in their crude temples. Temple concludes that the Dagon might have learned about Sirius and fish gods from Egyptians, who probably passed down the information by the Babylonians, Greeks, and other ancient cultures. But where did the Egyptians get such detailed information about the cosmos? While most cosmetologists shrug off theories of extraterrestrial connections, Temple suspects intelligent beings from outer worlds. Perhaps the region of Sirius visited Earth in antiquity and imparted such knowledge. I don't know why, but I've always been drawn to Sirius and Sirius B. It is worth noting that the Dagon tribe is believed to be of Egyptian descent. After migrating from Libya centuries ago, they settled in West Africa, bringing with them astronomical lore traceable to pre-dynastic Egypt before 3200 BC. The Dagon insist their knowledge was delivered by cosmic voyagers long ago. Their mythology suggests they leaned and learned from Nomos and Phidias, repulsive-looking beings who arrived in a fiery dark. The Nomos, who lived mostly in the sea, are depicted as partly fish-like and, at least in a general way, reminiscent of merfolk, mermaids. I knew they existed. Ancient Babylonian mythology makes reference to similar starborn creatures called Ohms, while earlier societies gave them different names. The Sumerians, for example, called them Inki. E-N-K-I, you must know. Dagon also speak of a second star orbiting Sirius, at right angles to Sirius B. They call it Emiya, son of woman. But this celestial object is presently unknown to science. The Gon tradition holds that this second star is the home of Nomos. It's so crazy. I mean, yeah, we can get through this before uh, next break. Harry Anu, or is it Aiming I in you? First Western visitors to reach Japan's northern islands were surprised to discover a primitive race of people who bore a physical resemblance to Europeans. The discovery came in 1854, shortly after American Commodore Matthew Perry persuaded Japan's rulers to abandon their centuries-old policy of near-total isolation and open borders to the outside world. Soon, newspapers in America and England were full of strange stories about tall, white-skinned men and women with blonde hair and greenish eyes whose eyelids lack the small fold of skin on the upper eyelid that covers the inner corner of the eye for many Asian people. The white-skinned people were found in Japan's northernmost main island, Hokkaido, and on Sakhalin and the real islands farther north. They call themselves Ainu, A-I-N-U, meaning man in their language. The Ainus, or hairy Ainus, as they came to be called because of their thick and often wavy beards and abundant body hair, represent an anthropological 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 Enigma, while their physical appearance clearly sets them apart from Asian neighbors. Their language is unrelated to any known tongue. The first known reference to the Ainu is found in a Japanese account written in 642. They became regular trading partners with Japan in the 8th century, specializing in hide, fur, fish oil, feathers, and dried fish in exchange for metal tools and luxury goods. Despite their pachyzoid appearance, they were separated by thousands of miles from their nearest possible relatives and surrounded by Asian peoples. 
Who are the Harry I knew? Where did they originate? How did they come to be where they are? Nobody knows, not even Jack Japanese anthropologists who have spent almost a century studying the Ainu culture. Ainu culture legends claim that their ancestors fell from the sky. Their way of life, however, closely resembles that of the people of the west coast of the Pacific Ocean. Some authorities believe that Ainu is one of many small, mysterious groups of people, remnants of early races that are fast fading into extinction. Many Ainu customs are found nowhere else in the world, such as the men's use of ceremonial mustache lifters and drinking, and tattooing of women around their mouths, and the absence of rites marking important stages in a person's life, including puberty. While bears played an important role in their religious ceremonies, I do believe the natural world is dominated by spirits, both good and bad. I can get with that. At the start of each new fishing season, they honor the complex pathian of gods with elaborate rituals, feeding the sea with tobacco and sweets. But if the Ainus have continued to fascinate their supposed relatives in the West, they have mostly inspired contempt and impatience in their neighbors, the Japanese. Since the 16th century, the Ainu, now numbering about 25,000 in population, have lost most of their ancestral lands to settlers from other parts of Japan. All research indicates that the Ainu have lived on the Japanese island since the earliest times. Hokkaido, Quiet Earth, where the peoples live, and Honshu contain many places bearing Ainu names, including the sacred volcano Fujiyama Moon for their fire goddess Fuji. I did a report on that in fifth grade. The Japanese trace their own ancestry to the vanished race they call the Doman people. According to tradition, the Doman, originating on the Eastern mainland, arrived long ago from the south, perhaps on a long submerged land bridge to Kopia, whereas the Ainu arrived from the north. Emerging into nationhood, the Japanese pushed the Ainu's father and farther north, and finally off Honshu. Near the end of the 19th century, they began to displace them on the Kaidu, or Haigado. The Japanese have long held that their ancestors occupied the islands thousands of years ago, but the belief has lately been challenged by the findings of American anthropologist Christy D. Turner III. An examination of fossilized teeth in Japan shows that modern Japanese probably immigrated to Japan from China several centuries after the arrival of the Ainu. I don't know, I don't really believe that because if you look at Chinese and Japanese people and um, my grandma Jean, she's Japanese. If you look at their face and their eyelids and such, and I'm not trying to pick it apart, but sorry, I still have like five more minutes maybe to get a cut because I'm not sure if I can get through this in five minutes, but eyelids are different, different structures in the facial, you know, system as far as recognition. To me, it's different. So I don't know. I think Japanese have always been Japanese and I don't think they were before Chinese. That's just me. You make your own thing. Ririus map. Deep below Antarctica's quivering ice caps lie the frozen remains of an ancient civilization that ruled the world thousands of years before the coming of the Mesopotamians of Greece. So say a number of scholars who contend that this long-vanished kingdom at the bottom of the globe might have been the father of all cultures, perhaps even the biblical Garden of Eden. Much of the evidence is based on an obscure 16th century map said to be drawn from an even older map used by Christopher Columbus when he set out to discover the New World in 1492. The 
so-called Peririus map, named after the famous Turkish admiral who created it in 1513, shows not only the Atlantic Ocean and North and South America, also what some believe to be the continent of Antarctica. The map confirms that an advanced Ice Age civilization flourished in the region we now call Antarctica and is now buried thousands of feet below the snow and ice, says Charles A. Papgut of Keene College, an expert on ancient maps. This culture, at least in some respects, may well have been more advanced than the civilizations, civilizations of Egypt, Babylonia, Greece, and Rome. At the time of its drawing, the Piri Rius map, drawn on gazelle hide and featuring a web of lines crossing the Atlantic, was said to be the most accurate map in the world, but the fading parchment was forgotten until 1929, and it turned up in the archives of the Imperial Palace in Constantinople, Istanbul, Turkey. The rediscovery of the map created a sensation after studying the document Captain Arlington H. Mallory, a retired Navy officer and expert on ancient maps, concluded that the map revealed a part of the Antarctic coast called Queen Mark Land, a region covered with a thick mantle of ice for thousands of years. Captain Mallory theorized that Peri had in his possession maps of Antarctica based on information gathered at a time before ice covered the continent. A little more than 10,000 years ago. Moreover, Mallory said it was clear that the map makers had access to information gathered from the air. In his book, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, Professor Hapgood suggested that thousands of years before the pyramids, there flourished a civilization that possessed a technology far superior to anything known until modern times. Some of the geographical knowledge, for example, had been passed on, often in garbled form, to the geographers of Greece and Rome, and had finally wound up in the Imperial Palace of Constantinople, he wrote. It was from such information that Piri Reis had obtained his picture of Antarctica before the last ice age. To bolster his theory, Professor Hapgood cites a number of archaeological sites in Europe, Africa, Asia, and South America. He thinks were inspired by common Ice Age ancestors. These ancestors, whether native to this planet or stranded survivors from another world, possessed navigational and technological skills far superior to the peoples of ancient, medieval, or recent modern times, the professor added. Now this was extraordinary, he told Fate magazine in 1966. In the first place, nobody is supposed to have discovered Antarctica until 1818, 300 years after Paris Rius, and it is regarded as unthinkable that the Greeks, Romans, Babylonians, or Phoenicians should have sailed that far in the second place ice cap in Antarctica is supposed to be millions of years old, and therefore to have been in existence long before man evolved on Earth. The professor maintains that source maps used by Piri to compile his conversational documents were themselves based on earlier maps, compilations of which were made at the Great Library of Alexandria, Egypt. The puzzle, he suggests, is not so much from Peri Rius, imagined to draw such an accurate map of the Antarctic region more than three centuries before it was discovered, but where the original source for the document came from. Noted map, uh, map experts at the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Office to verify the authenticity of the ancient map was so accurate. Only one thing could explain it, a worldwide aerial survey. Since flying machines weren't invented until the 20th century, thousands of years after elements of the Kiri Rius map were published, the question that begs to be answered is, who did the aerial survey? Some investigators think 
they might have been voyagers from another world sent to Earth perhaps on an exploratory or colonizing mission. That's simple logic, explained Captain John Brent, a Naval Academy graduate and authority on the Piri Rix map. A race far more technically advanced than we are today existed on Earth thousands of years ago. Something must have happened. Disastrous accident, perhaps, or a war on their home planet that stopped the mission. Survivors of that mission, Captain Brent said, remained on Earth and fell into a primitive state. Memories of their advanced world beyond the stars remained alive in legends and myth. Proof that Earth was visited in prehistoric by beings from outer space can be found in the Harry Rius map, according to Swiss researcher Arthur Eric Van Daniken. Unquestionably, said Von Daniken, our forefathers did not draw these maps. Yet there is no doubt that the maps must have been made with the most modern technical aid from the air. And there's so many things that are made for people to see from me. On that note, boys and girls, we do have to go for our first music break. On this break, we have Mr. De by Jeff Hilliard from Los Angeles, California, with Consensual Sex Band, Clock the Hills, Finger Bang Your Day, Live, Multitude, Abandoned, and then we'll get back into story time. You guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this music break. Do you want to go for a ride in my consensual sex van? Do you want to go for a ride in my consensual sex van? Let me take you far.
Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Just get in the van.
starts looking like a dumpster fire You start bitching to me but you're preaching to the choir You don't need to be so mad Cause sometimes we hurt, sometimes we cry Sometimes we're sure there's no reason to try When the whole world goes completely insane Open your heart, stand up and sing I'm gonna finger bang my day Yeah, yeah, oh finger bang my day That's right Make the choice to give it all you've got And make your day long with pleasure Really make it hot Because your day deserves a lover That pulls out the stops Come on, it's not has this much hate we have to get honest with ourselves we have to take stock in what our part is in all of this madness we have to let go and we focus on giving love setting that intention and each and every single one of us gets up every day with the intention to give love and we do it we go out there and we give love every single day each one of us gets out there and makes love to our day
your guards not going to save you. They're hiding behind the moon, watching your every move. This is a good life. So what's your latitude? Let's adjust your attitude. Hey, what up, alligator, double dooly Lamborghini. All up in a silly little yellow bugger top bikini. I got all the moves. I got that all the tools. You think it's wrong? Back in the head too long. Fuck that. Hey, what up, alligator, double dooly Lamborghini. All up in a silly little yellow bugger top bikini. Check these all the moves. Do you need them all the tools? I can do no wrong. Back in the head, I'm gonna cut it. Hey, what up, alligator, double dooly Lamborghini. All up in a You're like the butt of a butter, not cutting up panini. So climb back in your kangaroo pouch like a rogue genie. These moves are hot, these locks I got. This power cannot be disputed and it can't be bought. So you can find me in the studio with all these thoughts. You want to buy my style, but you can't do what you're not, neighbor. I got all the moves, I got that molar too. You think it's wrong, back of the head too long, fuck that. Check these molar moves, you need them.
and welcome back and thank you so much for joining me this evening on We Are Paradox Media's Late Night Rockies. I'm so glad you could join us this evening and I hope you've been enjoying story time this evening we're reading from We Read of Floyd's Hundreds or the World's Hundred Greatest Mysteries Strange Secrets of the World Revealed. been enjoying this book. I don't know about you guys, but to me it's been pretty epic. Some pronunciations I've been kind of stumbling over, but it's been nice. Are you guys ready for more? Let me uh, double check my sound settings. Make sure I'm actually back in connect. Everything is good. Come on. The White Horse of Uffington. Colossal piece of artwork etched deeply into the side of a windswept hill has been a source of wonder for the people of Western England for more than 2,000 years. Known as the White Horse, the drawing is steeped in mystery and legend. No one knows who created the 370 foot long horse or why. One theory holds that the figure, thought to be the oldest such hill art in England, dates from the Roman invasion in 55 BC. Another advanced celebrated British archaeologist, Stuart Piggott, suggests the horse represents an ancient cult in God. Until recently, a popular notion was that the slender, graceful Korean figure is not a horse at all, but a dragon. A mythical dragon supposedly slain by St. George on nearby Dragon Hill. A pair pack of chalk upon which no grass will grow is purported to be where the dragon's blood spilled to move around. One legend suggests that the White Horse commemorates Alfred the Great's victory over the Danes in 1861. Modern scholarship, however, now attributes the work to the Bronze Age, tribe known as Belge, perhaps built as a shrine to some forgotten dead leader. For centuries, the White Horse has been one of the West Country's most popular enigmatic horse attractions. Enigmatic, that's the term. Located on the lonely year top near Wantage, the colossal carving is actually one of dozens of similar talk renderings in the region. Another nearby drawing is the giant word of Cern, which also dates back to the time of the Romans. Though their motives continue to be debated, the creators of White Horse accomplished a mammoth piece of artwork. They swell up the steep slopes, deep slopes of a 500 foot hill known locally as Huffington Castle. The horse was constructed by carving deeply through sod to the solid chalk surface of the Downs of Wessex, aka Wessex Hills. Swaths in many areas are actually terraces banked up in some places, and the horse's eye is a level platform raised above deeper trenches in the chalk. The club-toting stern giant is of simpler construction, which is scratched into the sward. But the giant's proportions are impressive, pacing out at 180 feet from head to toe and 167 feet across from the tip of the club to the opposite hand. Oh my. One of the earliest recorded accounts of the Wild Horse, aka White Horse, and Cern Giant is an entry in the Cartillary Abington, Abington Abbey. In 13th and 14th century documents, the horse is mentioned several times in connection with accounts of nearby land tenures. 
Left to nature, the horse and giant would have disappeared under weeds long ago. For three seven years, however, the local country folk turned out to trim the vegetation and clean out the gouges that comprise the inclined figure. Although the tradition has been going on for some 2,000 years, not one of these faithful attendees has ever been able to explain the local compulsion to preserve the white horse. The cleansing or scouring of the chalk outlines appears to have been lively of an event in the often dreary lives of the West Country folk. The occasion usually coincided with Whitsuntide, which is celebrated the seventh Sunday after Easter. The scouring was accompanied by festivals and merrymaking, and the caretakers of the stern giant danced around the maypole, raising a hearty hue and cry from local clergymen who decreed the celebration as pagan rites. Churchmen were especially kept by scandalized by local lore and advised barren wives to sleep overnight during the general night magically induced pregnancy. Did you imagine? Rites such as these suggest to some archaeologists that the top horse and giant quickly trace back that on the mystic religious practices of the ancient Celts. One popular legend holds that if you stamp upon the horse's head and make a wish, it shall come true. Vikings. Oh of all the terrors that plagued medieval Europe, none was more dreaded than the sight of a Viking warship bearing down on a Christian stronghold. Such encounters were enough to make even the most stout-hearted defender of the faith turn and run. Mid a hell of flowing arrows, of flame and slashing broadswords, the howling bands of bearded, bloodthirsty invaders would descend, killing, raping, thundering, and burning everything in their path. From the wrath of the Northmen, O Lord, deliver us! became a common lament as Vikings pressed south, east, and west, conquering and pillaging in Ireland, the Byzantium. One ninth century French chronicler likened a Viking invasion to the end of the world, fire and blood and death everywhere. Christian Europe first became fully aware of their heathen Scandinavian neighbors to the north in the 8th century, when shipborne raiders sacked the monastery at Lundensfer in the northeastern island. Isolated Viking raids continued into the next century facing monks and villagers away from far-flung outposts of Western Europe and as far east as the Black Sea and Constantinople. Medieval monks depicted the Norsemen as pagan devils. Brutal and careless, they saw them as in league with Satan, more beasts than men, horrific heathens without conscience or spirituality. Whenever the morning went out, that a Viking ship was approaching, everybody fled rather than confront the mindless, savage brute. But is it all true? I'm not quite sure. Were these rugged blonde warriors who swept down out of the north the brutal barbarians of legend? Or was their fire and thunder reputation merely the invention of enemies who sought to malign them? Some scholars say the Vikings have been given a bad rap. Modern historians now see the Scandinavian raiders as traders and explorers, settlers and poets, and extraordinarily gifted artists and craftsmen. Consider the fact that all the reports that have found about attacks were from churchmen. Can you say drama? drama. The only Europeans who could read or write in those days, commented 
Magnus Magnusson, an Icelandic archaeologist and expert on Viking history, even when describing victories over Vikings, Magnusson said such reports tend to exaggerate their opponents' numbers and ferocity. When dealing with the stack of churches, no words could be too black. Unfortunately, since Vikings were illiterate, there are no documents telling their point of view. Modern scholarship is gradually revealing a different picture of the Vikings. Magnuson pointed out one that challenges the traditional, no traditional notion that Vikings were cruel and savage assassins intent only on invading the wealth of the supremely Christian Europe. To be sure, the Vikings did pillage and destroy especially churches and monasteries. From their pagan point of view, Dr. Gwyn Jones, an American researcher of Viking history, the Christians must have appeared unbelievably stupid, arming their churches with gold and silver ornaments and leaving them undefended except by monks and priests. But, he added, the Vikings did not just leave smoking ruins whenever they went before passing on the fresh pastures for plunder. They were builders as well as destroyers. For example, he said, the Vikings were among the finest artists and craftsmen of their age, excelling in animal carvings, metalworking, shipbuilding, and naval technology. They brought with them new ideas and products that in many ways helped transform the drought economies of Europe and is Europe. Furs, cattle, dairy products, and amber were among the many Viking products traded with neighbors in the south. Perhaps their most important contribution, according to some scholars, was the notion of colonization. In time, Viking explorers spread out among the lonely, uninhabited islands of North Atlantic. Settlements sprang up in Iceland and Greenland by the 10th century small groups were staking claims along the fog-shrouded shores of North America and its continent, the first known European voyagers to the New World. The Bang Skip <laughs> Vern made fun of me when I gave birth to Lily and I was like, here, hold this baby. I need to go out and have a cigarette. It's like, come on. That was my, my fourth stroke, you know? I was on an age. Okay. So we head on to the right head of the Easter Island. Such Admiral Jacob Rogavine could not believe his eyes. Looming over the rugged shoreline in the near distance were hundreds of colossal giants, their massive helmeted heads erect and not moving as the Admiral's ship drew dangerously close to the small, uncharted island in the middle of the South Pacific. Was this some lost race, the Admiral wondered? The giants of the Earth, mentioned in the Bible perhaps? Sailing closer, the Admiral was relieved to find the giants were only stone statues, and that the naked, heavily tattooed men who walked among them were mere mortals. The date was April 5th, 1722, since this was Easter Sunday. Admiral Bull Admiral Ragavan named his discovery Easter Island and sailed away. Well good on him. Hmm. Almost half a century would pass before Europeans sailed this way again. It took another century before European explorers committed to an extensive survey of the remote island some 2,700 miles east of Tahiti and 2,550 miles west of Chile. The Europeans were amazed at what they found. Hundreds of gigantic statues, some more than 66 feet tall and weighing as much as 30 tons. 
actually 50 tons, lying scattered all over the island. Most of the stone statues no longer stood erect, as had been observed by Admiral Rugabine. Instead, they littered the rocky ground with gigantic boulders. Only a few rose, mysterious and godlike, their granite expressions frozen in the salt laden breezes that swept in from the grey sea. What the startled Europeans wanted to know was, who built the colossal stone statues called Moa, and why? Scientists believe Easter Island was first settled at least 1,600 years ago, perhaps earlier by Polynesian explorers. Thor Heyerdahl, however, suspects that pre-Inca people from Peru might have migrated to this far-flung outpost. As evidence, he cites, freshwater plants and vegetables found on Easter Island that are native, native to the Andes, as well as similarly in regions and religious customs and the existence on both places of fair-skinned, red-haired people. Wherever their origins, it appears that, at least for the first few centuries, these hardy newcomers built smaller statues similar to pre-Columbian works found in South America. At some point, the islanders restored to carving the massive moai, an undertaking that required enormous demands on labor and resources. Nobody knows why, but some islanders today think their heads were monuments to dead rulers and were once infused with benevolent supernatural power they call mana. Some mystics claim that Easter Island was part of the lost continent and contend that stone monoliths possess magnetic healing power, similar to the standing stones found in Britain and elsewhere in the world. Orders suggest that it was mysteriously joined to Egypt, ancient Egypt, or that its original inhabitants came from outer space. It's either got to be Egypt or outer space, you know. There is no in-between. The works were apparently created by craftsmen from the culture known as long ears. People extended their earlobes by inserting heavy discs in them. The second distinctive group of people who shared the island are known as short ears because they did nothing to their lobes. Ancestor worshipping, long eared islanders believed that when a tribal chief died, his soul, an internal force called Mana, would be captured for the future benefit of the community by carving giant statues as a dwelling place for Mana. The massive stylized figures that resulted are majestic, yet disturbing. The heads are immense, their expressions rude but disturbing. Their heads were massive and their ears grotesquely elongated, their chins jutting and powerful. Arms hang rigidly at the sides of legless trunks, and extend stiffly crossed, protuberant bellies. The heads, once crowned with enormous stone hats, appear flat and gruffly chiseled. While the carving began early, the craze reached its highest expression in the 14th and 15th centuries. More than a, a thousand statues have been found, most between 12 and 15 feet tall, and weighing an average of 20 tons. The giant statues were apparently carved from volcanic rock found in the dormant crater of Rano Raraku, one, Easter Islands, one of Easter Island's three volcanoes. More than 300 heads were chiseled from the crater, then lowered down its slope and somehow maneuvered into upright positions. Inside the crater, archaeologists found some 400 uncompleted statues, obsidian hatches and chisels, banded by the ancient sculptors, also found in the crater. Mystery continues to surround the creations because the culture of their creators was destroyed. 
So much of its early history that long ears and short ears flourished side by side on their island paradise, lush with coconut palms and forests. After centuries of peaceful coexistence, however, stands clashed. Retro. Civil War followed Civil War, reducing the population from 20,000 to 4,000. That's a drastic scene. Hello, beautiful Sandra. Oh, come on. Welcome back to the waking world. Okay, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. Yeah, can you believe it? 20,000 to 4,000? Sorry, my hair is still kind of damp, so it's kind of heavy. I'm trying to manage it. So it happens. The winners of the Ravaged Island were the Short Eared Man. Great unanswered question is how the island's inhabitants transported the monument or erected them on bases. Theories that logs were used as rollers were discounted. After a test shows that each island soil could not support trees of the size required for such an exercise. Before I say my hypothesis, I am going to have to. DoorDash, enjoy it, Sandra. I haven't done DoorDash since I've been back. I think I'm kind of scared, but um, yeah, I'm going to do it again. So the unanswered question is, all the island's inhabitants transported the monuments or erected them on bases. Okay, I already said that. Logs were too heavy. Another possibility considered was that vines woven into ropes were used to haul them in place. But this, too, was ruled out after it was proved that vine ropes could not stand the strain of pulling 30 plus tons of rock. Okay, so aside from how the work was done, there is another mystery. Who did the work? Some authorities say there was never sufficient labor available on the island at any one time to assemble the colossal statues. Others say the primitive islanders lacked the engineering know-how. Even though archaeology has shown that statues are fairly easy to carve out of volcano rock, some experts doubt the Islanders' population would have been sufficient to carve the colossal creations and roll them into place. Even 2,000 men working day and night would not be nearly enough to carve these colossal figures out of the still hard volcanic stone with rudimentary tools, and at least a part of the population must have killed the barren fields gone fishing, woven cloth, and made ropes, said Eric von Deniken. You know, Eric von Deniken knows everything. We all know that. Author of The Chariots of the God. The solemn stone faces give no answers. The truth about Easter Island's secret past may never be known. So I don't know, um, I heard a theory that they did use ropes and it was kind of like they'd, sorry, I'm trying to tuck my book and I'll just tuck it in between my legs, but they'd take these ropes and they'd wrap it around and they kind of teeter it, you know, and there's like four or five guys here or 10 or 15 or whatever. And they're teetering it back and forth and they're making it walk into place. That to me makes sense. Like ancient pyramids you have to take stones 25 to 30 thousand pounds heavy and brute them up into this singular thing how do you do that logs ropes things like that aren't gonna do it and i'm pretty sure it's those damn islands let me look at this next chapter pretty sure we can get through this i hope you don't dashes to it sandra Jason, thank you for the compliment. I actually um, just washed my hair, so it's nice and, nice and fluffy. I might soup it this way for a little bit. And then this dress, I got at Woolly World for $10. And look, it's got like, uh, I think there's a heart up top, and then other different beads. I love it. For $10, you can't be that with a stick.
Yeah, I don't think it was slaves either. Okay, I agree with you, Jason. I think it was either giants, which I think giants did and still do exist. When I went to Mazatlan, I was sitting there um, looking around as I'm driving, and there's so many trees and stuff. I couldn't really see cliff faces unless I was kayaking down, but I saw a video right before I went to Mazatlan about a giant in the side of the mountain. And this to me was definitely not CGI. Like, this to me was. You could see this cave, and inside the cave, you could see something moving around and, like, tear its head out. And, and then, uh, you know, it's looking around, trying to see what everybody's doing. You look back in, and then you could see it kind of, like, move around. Because the space was so tight, it couldn't really get out of there. Um, but I do believe giants did and still do exist. I believe that the Smithsonian has been hiding shit from us. I don't know if it's because of the Vatican or anybody else that's been doing that stuff, but I'm going to quit babbling and go back to the argument, you know. Hey, the smartest cookie in the bin. Turn this down a little bit, too. Alright. I'm so glad you guys are with me. Now I don't feel so alone. I was feeling alone earlier. I was just like, where is everybody? Voyages from Beyond the Sea Early on the morning of October 12th, 1492, a young Spanish sailor on the lookout duty aboard the Santa Maria spotted something white and shimmering on the far horizon. Land, land, he shouted to weary shipmates. At daybreak, the ship's commander, Christopher Columbus, rode ashore and promptly named the new land San Salvador, Holy Savior, presumably out of gratitude for a successful voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. Besides his crew, the only witnesses to the momentous landing was a band of Taino Indians seeking from the jungle as Columbus claimed for his queen, the tropical island 400 miles southeast of Florida, called Guanahani by its inhabitants. Thus was born one of the world's greatest myths. Columbus discovered America. Hooray. Historians and most children now know that numerous other groups of Europeans, Asians, and perhaps even Africans preceded Columbus to the New World for many centuries. In fact, it now appears that the great admiral of the seas might have been a regular Johnny Comedy, who transatlantic traveled. Natives were first immigrating in successive ways across the now submerging land bridge in pursuit of ice age quarry like giant bison, bison, elk, woolly mammoths. In time, perhaps over 50,000 years, these Hardy nomads explored and settled vast regions of the Americas from Alaska to South America and the islands of the Caribbean in between. Some established magnificent civilizations like the Aztecs and Maya, Central America, and Inca, the Peru. Others retained more primitive lifestyles and became ancestors of the Sioux, Choctaw, and hundreds of other tribes. By the time of Columbus's arrival, the Indian civilizations of America were indeed ancient. Scholarly debate continues about which group of people came next. Some experts believe a variety of pre-Christian era sailors, Greeks, Egyptians, Phoenicians, Libyans, and Romans made frequent trips across the Atlantic, either on purpose or because they were blown off course. Iberian warriors and fur-clad Celts are also thought to have sailed across the mysterious monster-haunted sea in search of paradise or to flee the long blades of berserkers coming down from the north. Coins, religious objects, rune tablets, stone forts, and other custom artifacts seem to indicate that America was a people 
race among old world travelers thousands of years before Columbus's heralded landfall. In fact, historians and archaeologists now think that the Atlantic Ocean might have been a veritable freeway linking the old and new worlds in ancient and medieval times. Dr. Joseph Mahan, a Georgia archaeologist, thinks he has found evidence that ancient Hebrews reached the hills of Tennessee in the first century AD. Mahan bases his claim on a rock tablet found in Loudoun County in 1889. Inscriptions on the tablet Unearthed, along with nine human skeletons in a single bound, were translated to read. A comment for the Jews. An obvious reference to one of the skeletons who had been the group's comet or leader, according to the Sirius Gurin, a symmetric language expert who worked with Mahan on deciphering the tablet. Barry Fell, now retired from Harvard University, has long argued that North America was explored and settled thousands of years ago by various groups of Europeans and Africans. In his book, America B.C., Dr. Fell points to hundreds of stone tablets. We don't even know how to... Anyways, let's get back to the book, shall we? <laughs> but I mean, what do you think? The fabled region thought by some scholars to be the southeast of the state's coast or Caribbean islands. Selling in United Kingdoms, there might have been a grain of truth behind St. Brendan's voyage. It is known that Viking raiders, see I told you, some modern scholars think the prince named Madabama, after fleeing his homeland during a civil war, according to tradition, a small band of Welsh is said to have landed near what is now Mobile Bay, Alabama. Although often Lynn, when examining records concerning pre Columbian voyages, some scholars believe it is only a matter of time before the history of America will have, be, have to be rewritten to make into account cultural contacts between old and new worlds. There is more to America past than appears upon the surface, Dr. Phil wrote. A strange unrest is apparent among many of the younger historians and archaeologists. A sense that somehow a very large slice of America's past has mysteriously vanished from our public records. On that note, boys and girls, we do have to end our time with story time. For this book, the world's greatest mysteries and with fantasy and fact Instagram sorry Instagram under Antidote for Savages and that is where you shall find Mia Savage with her group Antidote for Savages so she's going to be singing the bottom line not a phase your skeleton ending with the mirror and crypto you guys don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this music break. I love Mia. She's awesome.
Between fear 